There's a lot that we don't know about plastics and health. We've heard that repeatedly this morning. But you know, there's a lot that we do know. There's a lot, particularly about the chemicals that are in plastics. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. There's a lot that we know, and it's enough to give me great pause. Um, in fact, it, thinking back to Cyril's opening comments, the single most important thing for us to do, irrespective of the microplastic issue, but of the general chemical issue, plastic issue, is to redesign plastics. I think he hit it on the nail. Redesign is the central, crucial R for solving this problem. That's especially true for things like the chemicals I work on, bisphenols, phthalates, perfluorinated compounds. Once they get into our bodies, they can wreak havoc of multiple kinds, largely by, inter by hacking the hormone system, by changing how genes are being turned on and off, leading to serious developmental problems, and problems, as Ju Juliet showed, problems that can unfold throughout life following a fetal exposure. I've got a personal story to tell about this. That's my granddaughter. She was born prematurely, weighing two and a half pounds, last January, and she spent two months in the neonative intensive care unit. Um, the plastics in that unit saved her life. They really did. Those plastics can do miraculous things. But unfortunately, there's another side to this story. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard about all the forest fires that are taking place in the United States. This is paradise California, after the fire. Those houses were full of plastic, and they burned. And that smoke, Paradise is that big white patch up there, the smoke went to the Bay Area, where my daughter was in the beginning of her third trimester of pregnancy. Her house was surrounded by some of the worst air pollution, including plastic that was volatilized by the burning fire that has ever been recorded in the San Francisco area. And when I discovered, and, and when on January 8th she had to go to the neonatal uh, care unit for, premature, for an emergency cesarean because of preeclampsia, I, I asked the question, wait a second, did that smoke have anything to do with her premature birth. And I quickly, literally within 15 minutes, found a series of papers, including some by my colleagues, who show that smoke in general and smoke and exposure to bisphenol A and phthalates are risk factors for the very condition that forced that premature birth. So how do we wind up here? We've got this miraculous set of, of materials that save lives but also that have, can have, and I know it's, I, I can't state with certainty that my daughter's preeclampsia resulted from this exposure, but it's very plausible. Uh, how, how is it, how can we hold both these thoughts in, in mind at once, and what do we have to do to solve that problem? So what is the, the reality? Oh, here, here's one of the references, if any of you want to see the links between preeclampsia and premature birth. Um, so here's the question that I want to ask today. What, what's the reality of plastic toxicity in general? Not just microplastic toxicity, but plastic toxicity. Because frankly, if we can solve that problem, we're going to eliminate a lot of the toxicity issues related with plastic toxicity. Not all of them, some of the physical characteristics will be different, but it's, it's an important, it's a major pathway to solving this problem. Um, to understand the plastic, well, first of all, what are some of the health consequences linked to exposure to plastic compounds? This is a list of today's hormonally related diseases. They're epidemics today, infertility, obesity, type 2 diabetes, prostate cancer, breast cancer. And there is serious scientific research from epidemiology, from animal experiments, and from direct experiments with people and exposure and, and observations with human cells, linking endocrine-disrupting compounds with P53 
peer-reviewed research to each of those conditions there. Those are today's modern epidemics. What makes plastic toxic? Well, you have the monomer, what the, the, the molecule that is the base of plastics that when chained together into a long, much longer poly, polymer becomes the basis of the plastics that we incorporate in, our, in the products we all depend upon every day. Sometimes the monomer itself is toxic. Bisphenol A, BPA, and its brethren, all the other, BP, all the other bisphenols, those monomers are overtly toxic at really low doses. Second, you have the additives, the things like phthalates, that are not bound to the plastic, but are in it. They're infused within it to change its material characteristics. And virtually every plastic that's made from whatever monomer, not all, but almost all, have plastic additives to tweak the material characteristics so it's exactly what a chemical engineer wants to build the product they're trying to build. Then you have this mix of stuff called non-intentionally added substances, which aren't put there on purpose, but they, they're reaction byproducts. And there are thousands of them. And some we know about, but most we don't. We know they're there, because we can detect them chemically, but we don't know what they are, which by nef definition means we don't understand the toxicity underlying them. And lastly, we, we know that uh, chemicals and uh, bacteria adhere to the surfaces of plastic pieces, and also the chemicals are absorbed within the plastic, uh, creating another pathway by which plastics can affect health. So it's a complex list of reasons. Um, and as I studied this, I began this work literally 30 years ago, as he mentioned. Um, I actually coined the term endocrine disruption at a scientific meeting in 1991, um, I began to have real questions about the adequacies of the ways that we have tested stuff for what's safe and what's not. Because clearly with the plastics, we've made some big mistakes. Um, what are low doses? You talk, hear talk about a part per billion, um, and it's often dismissed as totally irrelevant. Well, how many of you have an idea of what a part per billion is? Some friends of mine did this calculation. A part per billion is one pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high. <laughs> I'm not sure how many kilometers it is. It's 6,000 kilometers, more or less. But anyway, it sounds like a tiny amount. But let's look at that question from a somewhat different perspective. Imagine that you have a drop of water, one drop of water, and it's concentration of bisphenol A is one part per billion in that drop of water. How many molecules of BPA do you think might be in that one drop? 2.65 trillion molecules of BPA are in that one drop. There are a billion times more molecules of water, but 2.65 trillion is a lot, especially when you begin to understand how hormone systems are driven by really, really low concentrations. Toxicology, when it started, mostly focused on high doses, understandably. People were dying in factories. They were living on toxic sites, toxic dump sites, and being exposed to high doses. But gradually, as the study of endocrinology began to flow into work on toxicology, we learned that we had to approach things differently, that low doses can matter a lot. And I could go on for hours about how that complicates that classic equation that we heard mentioned multiple times, risk equals hazard times exposure. In hormone-disrupting chemicals, endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and hormones, different things happen at low doses than happen at high doses. So you can't use high-dose experiments to predict what is happening at low doses. And most of toxicology has not responded to that endocrinological reality. So this, this odyssey over the last 30 years has led to, for me, a series of painful realizations. Um, no plastic has been tested thoroughly. 
None. Zip. Zero. Nada. For all the, the plausible and important health effects that may be related to it. The tests that are used are based upon old principles, 16th century principles, that allow you to do test at high doses and believe that's sufficient to, re, to reveal low-dose results, but that's not the case. It does, endocrine disrupting compounds, as I said, don't work that way. And the regulatory toxicology, the actually agencies like EFSA, the US FDA, EPA, um, they use assays that are 10, 20, 30 years out of date. They do not use modern 21st century science to figure out, is this compound safe or not? And we have to change that situation. Core assumptions driving those tests are wrong. The dose does not necessarily make the poison. Low doses can happen that are not detected by high-dose results. Mixtures. What does your doctor ask you whenever they start to prescribe a new um, drug for you? The first thing they ask is, what else are you taking? Toxicologists only test chemicals for regulatory um, purposes, one chemical at a time. That's so flawed, it's unbelievable. And yet, we accept their conclusions that this is safe and that's not. And then, unfortunately, because there's a lot of money at stake, bisphenol A, for example, is worth, by now, probably uh, at least a, a million dollars an hour in revenue globally. That leads to companies protecting their products, spinning science, creating doubt about what the real circumstances are to make sure their product stays on the market. Okay, so these problems are real. They're there, they're there today, in, and, and together we have to start working on them. Um, now, part of the theme of this meeting is we've got to worry about the next generation. Well, I agree completely. It, um, Juliet's slide showed how fetal exposures can play out over the lifetime of an individual. It's worse than that. We now have serious science showing that exposures to great-grandmother, the woman in red, can affect a child born three generations later who was never directly exposed to the chemical that mother, that great-grandmother experienced. It's called transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. And this issue got much more complicated, complicated over the last two years when it, when it was discovered with two scientific papers that the effects don't necessarily show up in the daughter or the granddaughter. They only begin to show up, not always, usually they do show up in the daughter and the granddaughter, but some jump generations to appear generations down the stream. And this is without DNA uh, mutations. It's, the DNA has not changed. It's changes in how the DNA is controlled. So if you want an argument to use for why we have to approach these issues from a precautionary perspective, think about these four generations and more that are affected by fetal exposures. This is, a, this is something that the regulatory agencies have never even begin, begun to ask, how do we incorporate information like this in our assessments of what's safe and what's not? And the science keeps coming out. We heard today the mention of how many billions of nanoparticles and microparticles are released into a teacup by making tea the way that all of us make tea. Um, well, another study came out within the last month or so that shows that three quarters of plastics products this team tested have one or another form of toxicity associated with it. There's the reference, if, if, if any you want to see it. It was a real eye-opener. Even I didn't think it was going to be that bad. Different types of toxicity. Oh, and, and one of the kickers was everyone's favorite bio-based plastic, polylactic acid, was one of the worst ones tested. So we can't assume that because it's bio-based, it's safe. In this case, it's probably because of the additives that are put into PLA plastic to make it achieve the characteristics that it want, that, that we need, but who knows. Anyway, um, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. As, and I want to think about the three R's, in fact, some new three R's. As Jane Munka has argued, recycling is the fig leaf of consumerism. It gives us permission to do stuff we shouldn't be doing. 
The odds against us winning this, given the amount of money that's associated with the plastics in industry, are staggering, but it's not impossible. We need to think about, thanks to Cyril, actually, uh, um, we need to think about redesign. We know enough science to make inherently safer materials. We need to be doing that now. It will help chemists make money because there's a huge market that's emerged, that has emerged for inherently safer materials. Um, we need to reform. We need to reform the regulatory science as, is, as it is practiced today and bring it into the 21st century. We need to do that. And, and we need to use this new science to recharge the advocacy that's represented by so many of you in this room, advocacy that is pushing for reformed approaches to regulation and pushing for redesigning chemicals in the first place. So, my granddaughter is almost nine months old now and is looking healthy. Uh, exposure in the womb can cause a lot of problems that play out, but right now she's in good shape. Um, this problem is more serious than any of us imagine. Um, and what I want to leave you with is this URL. I'll give you all time to photograph it. It's a, a link to a website that we have where you can sign up for free to a weekly summary of this week's news about plastics and plastic issues from around the world called Into the Plasticine, which I debated calling Into the Obscene, but decided I had to be a little more specific. Anyway, so thank you very much. <laughs>